Joe of Lahaina by Charles Warren Stoddard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Burrard. Joe of Lahaina by Charles Warren Stoddard. Part 1. I was stormed in at Lahaina. Now, Lahaina is a little slice of civilization, beached on the shore of barbarism. One can easily stand that little of it, for brown and brawny heathendom becomes more wonderful and captivating by contrast. So I was glad of dear, drowsy little Lahaina, and was glad also that she had but one broad street, which possibly led to destruction and yet looked lovely in the distance it didn't matter to me that the one broad street had but one side to it for the sea lapped over the sloping sands on its lower edge and the sun used to set right in the face of every solitary citizen of lahaina just as he went to supper i was waiting to catch a passage in a passing schooner and that's why i came there but the schooner flashed by us in a great gale from the south and so i was stormed in indefinitely it was holy week and i concluded to go to housekeeping because it would be so nice to have my frugal meals in private to go to mass and vespers daily and then to come back and feel quite at home my villa was suburban built of dried grasses on the model of a haystack dug out in the middle with doors and windows let into the four sides thereof it was planted in the midst of a vineyard with avenues stretching in all directions under a network of stems and tendrils her breath is sweeter than the sweet winds that breathe over the grape blossoms of lahaina so the song said and i began to think upon the surpassing sweetness of that breath as i inhaled the sweet winds of lahaina while the wilderness of its vineyards blossomed like the rose i used to sit in my veranda and turn to joe joe was my private and confidential servant and i would say to joe while we scented the odour of grape and saw the great banana leaves waving their cambric sails and heard the sea moaning in the melancholy distance i would say to him joe housekeeping is good fun isn't it whereupon joe would utter a sort of unanimous yes with his whole body and soul so that question was carried triumphantly and we would relapse into a comfortable silence while the voices of the wily singers down on the city front would whisper to us and cause us to wonder what they could possibly be doing at that moment in the broad way that led to destruction then we would take a drink of cocoa milk and finish our bananas and go to bed because we had nothing else to do this is the way that we began our cooperative housekeeping one night when there was a riotous sort of a festival off in a retired valley i saw in the excited throng of natives who were going mad over their national dance a young face that seemed to embody a whole tropical romance on another night when a lot of us were bathing in the moonlight i saw a figure so fresh and joyous that i began to realize how the old greeks could worship mere physical beauty and forget its higher forms then i discovered that face on this body a rare enough combination when the whole constituted joe a young scapegrace who was schooling at lahaina under the eye not a very sharp one of his uncle when i got stormed in and resolved on housekeeping for a season i took joe bribing his uncle to keep the peace which he promised to do provided i gave bonds for joe's irreproachable conduct while with me i willingly gave bonds verbal ones for this was just what i wanted of joe namely to instill into his youthful mind those counsels which if rigorously followed must result in his becoming a true and unterrified american this compact settled joe took up his bed a roll of mats and down we marched to my villa and began housekeeping in good earnest we soon got settled and began to enjoy life though we were not without occasional domestic infelicities for instance joe would wake up in the middle of the night 
declaring to me that it was morning and thereupon insist upon sweeping out at once and in the most vigorous manner having filled the air with dust he would rush off to the baker's for our hot rolls and a pat of breakfast butter leaving me meantime to recover as i might having settled myself for a comfortable hour's reading bolstered up in a luxurious fashion joe would enter with breakfast and orders to the effect that it be eaten at once and without delay it was useless for me to remonstrate with him he was tyrannical he involved me in all manner of difficulties it was holy week and i had resolved upon going to mass and vespers daily i went the soft night winds floated in through the latticed windows of the chapel and made the candles flicker upon the altar the little throng of natives bowed in the impressive silence and were deeply moved it was rest for the soul to be there yet in the midst of it while the father with his pale sad face gave his instructions to which we listened as attentively as possible for there was something in his manner and his voice that made us better creatures while we listened in the midst of it i heard a shrill little whistle a sort of chirp that i knew perfectly well it was joe sitting on a cocoa stump in the garden adjoining and beseeching me to come out right off when service was over i remonstrated with him for his irreverence joe i said if you have no respect for religion yourself respect those who are more fortunate than you but joe was dressed in his best and quite wild at the entrancing loveliness of the night let's walk a little said joe covered with fragrant wreaths and redolent of coconut oil what could i do if i had tried to do anything to the contrary he might have taken me and thrown me away somewhere into a well or a jungle and then i could no longer hope to touch the cord of remorse which cord i sought vainly and which i have since concluded was not in joe's physical corporation at all so we walked a little in vain i strove to break joe of the shocking habit of whistling me out at vespers he would persist in doing it moreover during the day he would collect crusts of bread and banana skins station himself in the ambush behind the curtain of the window next the lane and as some solitary creature strode solemnly past joe would discharge a volley of ammunition over him and then laugh immoderately at his indignation and surprise joe was my pet elephant and i was obliged to play with him very cautiously one morning he disappeared i was without the consolations of a breakfast even i made my toilet went to my portmanteau for my purse for i had decided upon a visit to the baker when lo part of my slender means had mysteriously disappeared joe was gone and the money also all day i thought about it in the morning after a very long and miserable night i woke up and when i opened my eyes there in the doorway stood joe in a brand new suit of clothes including boots and hat he was gorgeous beyond description and seemed overjoyed to see me and as merry as though nothing unusual had happened i was quite startled at this apparition joseph i said in my severest tones and then turned over and looked away from him joe evaded the subject in the most delicate manner and was never so interesting as at that moment he sang his specialties and played clumsily upon his bamboo flute to soothe me i suppose and wanted me to eat a whole flat pie which he had brought home as a peace offering buttoned tightly under his jacket i saw i must strike at once if i struck at all so i said joe what on earth did you do with that money joe said he had replenished his wardrobe and bought the flat pie especially for me joseph i said with great dignity do you know that you have been stealing and that it is highly sinful to steal and may result in something unpleasant in the world to come joe said yes pleasantly though i hardly think he meant it and then he added mildly that he couldn't lie which was a glaring falsehood but wanted me to be sure 
that he took the money and so had come back to tell me joseph i said you remind me of our noble washington and to my amazement joe was mortified he didn't of course know who washington was but he suspected that i was ridiculing him he came to the bed and haughtily insisted upon my taking the little change he had received from his customers but i implored him to keep it as i had no use at all for it and as i assured him i much preferred hearing it jingle in his pocket the next day i sailed out of lahaina and joe came to the beach with his new trousers tucked into his new boots while he waved his new hat violently in a final adieu much to the envy and admiration of a score of hatless urchins who looked upon joe as the glass of fashion and but little lower than the angels when i entered the boat to set sail a tear stood in joe's bright eye and i think he was really sorry to part with me and i don't wonder at it because our housekeeping experiences were new to him and i may add not unprofitable part two some months of mellow and beautiful weather found me wandering here and there among the islands when the gales came on again and i was driven about homeless and sometimes friendless until by and by i heard of an opportunity to visit molokai an island seldom visited by the tourist where perhaps i could get a close view of a singularly sad and interesting colony of lepers the whole island is green but lonely as you ride over its excellent turnpike you see the ruins of a nation that is passing like a shadow out of sight deserted garden patches crumbling walls and roofs tumbled into the one state chamber of the house while knots of long grass wave at half-mast in the chinks and crannies a land of great traditions of magic and witchcraft and spirits a fertile and fragrant solitude how i enjoyed it and yet how it was all telling upon me in its own way one cannot help feeling sad there for he seems to be living and moving in a long reverie out of which he dreads to awaken to a less pathetic life i rode a day or two among the solemn and reproachful ruins with inexpressible complacence and having finally climbed a series of verdant and downy hills and ridden for twenty minutes in a brisk shower came suddenly upon the brink of a great precipice three thousand feet in the air my horse instinctively braced himself and i nervously jerked the bridle square up to my breastbone as i found we were poised between heaven and earth upon a trembling pinnacle of rock a broad peninsula was stretched below me covered with grassy hills here and there clusters of brown huts were visible and to the right the white dots of houses to which i was hastening for that was the leper village to that spot were the wandering and afflicted tribes brought home to die once descending the narrow stairs in the cliff under me never again could they hope to strike their tents and resume their pilgrimage for the curse was on them and necessity had narrowed down their sphere of action to this compass a solitary slope between sea and land with the invisible sentinels of fear and fate forever watching its borders i seemed to be looking into a fiery furnace wherein walked the living bodies of those whom death had already set his seat upon what a mockery it seemed to be climbing down that crag through wreaths of vine and under leafy cataracts breaking into a foam of blossoms a thousand feet below me swinging aside the hanging parasites that obstructed the narrow way entering the valley of death and the very mouth of hell by these floral avenues a brisk ride of a couple of miles across the breadth of the peninsula brought me to the gate of the keeper of the settlement and there i dismounted and hastened into the house to be rid of the curious crowd that had gathered to receive me the little cottage was very comfortable my host and hostess friends of precious memory and with them i felt at once at home and began the new life that every one begins when the earth seems to have been suddenly transformed into some better or worse world 
and he alone survives the transformation have you never had such an experience then go into the midst of a community of lepers have ever before your eyes their gorgon-like faces see the horrors hardly to be recognized as human that grope about you listen in vain for the voices that have been hushed for ever by decay breathe the tainted atmosphere and bear ever in mind that while they hover about you forbidden to touch you yet longing to clasp once more a hand that is perfect and pure the insidious seeds of the malady may be generating in your vitals and your heart even then be drunk with death i might as well confess that i slept indifferently the first night that i was not entirely free from nervousness the next day as i passed through the various wards assigned to patients in every stage of decomposition but i recovered myself in time to observe the admirable system adopted by the hawaiian government for the protection of its unfortunate people i used to sit by the window and see the processions of the less afflicted come for little measures of milk morning and evening then there was a continuous raid upon the ointment pot with the contents of which they delighted to anoint themselves trifling disturbances sometimes brought the plaintiff and defendant to the front gate for a final judgment at the hands of their beloved keeper and it was a constant entertainment to watch the progress of events in that singular little world of doomed spirits they were not unhappy i used to hear them singing every evening their souls were singing while their bodies were falling rapidly to dust they continued to play their games as well as they could play them with the loss of a finger joint or a toe from week to week it is thus gradually and thus slowly that they died feeling their voices growing fainter and their strength less as the idle days passed over them and swept them to the tomb sitting at the window on the second evening as the patients came up for milk i observed one of them watching me intently and apparently trying to make me understand something or other but what that something was i could not guess he rushed to the keeper and talked excitedly with him for a moment and then withdrew to one side of the gate and waited till the others were served with their milk still watching me all the while then the keeper entered and told me how i had a friend out there who wished to speak with me some one who had seen me somewhere he supposed but whom i would hardly remember it was their way never to forget a face they had once become familiar with out i went there was a face i could not have recognized as anything friendly or human knots of flesh stood out upon it scar upon scar disfigured it the expression was like that of a mummy stony and withered the outlines of a youthful figure were preserved but the hands and feet were pitiful to look at what was this ogre that knew me and loved me still he soon told me who he once had been but was no longer our little unfortunate joe my lahaina charge in his case the disease had spread with fearful rapidity the keeper thought he could hardly survive the year many lingered year after year and cannot die but joe was more fortunate his life had been brief and passionate and death was now hastening him to his dissolution joe was forbidden to come near me so he crouched down by the fence and pressing his hands between the pickets sifted the dust at my feet while he wailed in a low voice and called me over and over dear friend good friend and master i wish i had never seen him so humbled to think of my disreputable little protege who was wont to lord it over me as though he had been a born chief to think of joe as being there in his extremity grovelling in the dust at my feet forbidden to climb the great wall of flowers that towered between him and his beautiful world while the rough sea lashed the coast about him and his only companions were such hideous foes as would frighten one out of a dream how i wanted to get close to him but i dared not so we sat there with the slats of the fence between us while we talked very long in the twilight and i was glad when it grew so dark 
and i could no longer see his face his terrible face that came to kill the memory of his former beauty and joe wondered whether i still remembered how we used to walk in the night and go home at last to our little house when lahaina was as still as death and you could almost hear the great stars throbbing in the clear sky how well i remembered it and the day when we went a long way down the beach and looking back saw a wide curve of the land cutting the sea like a sickle and turning up a white and shining swamp then in another place a grove of cocoa palms and a melancholy monastic-looking building with splendid palm branches in its broad windows for it was just after palm sunday and the building belonged to a sisterhood and i remembered how the clouds fell and the rain drove us into a sudden shelter and we ate tamarind jam spread thick on thin slices of bread and were supremely happy in this connection i could not forget how joe became very unruly about that time and i got mortified and found great difficulty in getting him home at all and yet the memory of it would have been perfect but for this fate oh joe my poor dear terrible cobra to think that i should ever be afraid to look into your face in my life joe wanted to call to my mind one other reminiscence a night when we two walked to the old wharf and went out to the end of it and sat there looking inland watching the inky waves slide up and down the beach while the full moon rose over the superb mountains where the clouds were heaped like wool and the very air seemed full of utterances that you could almost hear and understand but for something that made all a mystery i tried then if ever i tried in my life to make joe a little less bad than he was naturally and he seemed merely inclined to be better and would i think have been so but for the thousand temptations that gravitated to him when we got on solid earth again he forgot my precepts then and i'm afraid i forgot them myself joe remembered that night vividly i was touched to hear him confess it and i pray earnestly that that one moment may plead for him in the last day if indeed he needs any special plea other than that nature has published for her own sing for me joe said i and joe still crouching on the other side of the lattice sang some of his old songs one of them a popular melody was echoed through the little settlement where faint voices caught up the chorus and the night was wildly and weirdly musical we walked by the sea the next day and the day following that joe taking pains to stay on the leeward side of me he was so careful to keep the knowledge of his fate uppermost in his mind how could i dismiss it from my own when it was branded in his countenance the desolated beauty of his face pleaded for measureless pity and i gave it out of my prodigality yet felt that i could not begin to give sufficient link by link he was casting off his hold on life he was no longer a complete being his soul was prostrated in the miry clay and waited in agony its long deliverance in leaving the leper village i had concluded to say nothing to joe other than the usual aloha at night when i could ride off in the darkness and sleeping at the foot of the cliff ascend it in the first light of the morning and get well on my journey before the heat of the day we took a last walk by the rocks on the shore heard the sea breathing its long breath under the hollow cones of lava with a noise like a giant leper in his asthmatic agony joe heard it and laughed a little and then grew silent and finally said he wanted to leave the place he hated it he loved lahaina dearly how was everybody in lahaina a question he had asked me hourly since my arrival when night came i asked joe to sing as usual so he gathered his mates about him and they sang the songs i liked best the voices rang sweeter than ever up from the group of singers congregated a few rods off in the darkness and while they sang my horse was saddled and i quietly bade adieu to my dear friends the keepers and mounting walked the horse slowly up the grass-grown road i shall never see 
little joe again with his pitiful face growing gradually as dreadful as a cobra's and almost as fascinating in its hideousness i waited a little way off in the darkness waited and listened till the last song was ended and i knew he would be looking for me to say good night but he didn't find me and he never will and he will never again find me in this life for i left him sitting in the dark door of his sepulchre sitting and singing in the mouth of his grave clothed all in death end of joe of lahaina by charles warren stoddard thomas jefferson to roger waitman monticello june twenty fourth eighteen twenty six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org on the library of congress website we find these lines in the introduction to thomas jefferson's last public letter which relates to america's fourth of july celebration in which he eloquently espoused the central role of the united states and the declaration of independence as signals of the blessings of self-government to the world jefferson undoubtedly knew at his death on july fourth eighteen twenty six that the vagaries of life had left a vulnerable legacy thomas jefferson to roger waitman monticello june twenty fourth eighteen twenty six respected sir the kind invitation i received from you on the part of the citizens of the city of washington to be present with them at their celebration of the fiftieth anniversary of american independence as one of the surviving signers of an instrument pregnant with our own and the fate of the world is most flattering to myself and heightened by the honorable accompaniment proposed for the comfort of such a journey it adds sensibly to the sufferings of sickness to be deprived by it of a personal participation in the rejoicings of that day but acquiescence is a duty under circumstances not placed among those we are permitted to control i should indeed with peculiar delight have met and exchanged their congratulations personally with the small band the remnant of that host of worthies who joined with us on that day in the bold and doubtful election we were to make for our country between submission or the sword and to have enjoyed with them the consolatory fact that our fellow-citizens after half a century of experience and prosperity continue to approve the choice we made may it be to the world what i believe it will be to some parts sooner to others later but finally to all the signal of arousing men to burst the chains under which monkish ignorance and superstition had persuaded them to bind themselves and to assume the blessings and security of self-government that form which we have substituted restores the free right to the unbounded exercise of reason and freedom of opinion all eyes are opened or opening to the rights of man the general spread of the light of science has already laid open to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs nor a favored few booted and spurred ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of god these are grounds of hope for others for ourselves let the annual return of this day forever refresh our recollections of these rights and an undiminished devotion to them i will ask permission here to express the pleasure with which i should have met my ancient neighbors of the city of washington and of its vicinities with whom i passed so many years of a pleasing social intercourse an intercourse which so much relieved the anxieties of the public cares and left impressions so deeply engraved in my affections as never to be forgotten with my regret that ill health forbids me the gratification of an acceptance be pleased to receive for yourself and those for whom you write the assurance of my highest respect and friendly attachments 
Thomas Jefferson. Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on the 4th of July, 2017. Makers of the Flag, June 14, 1914, by Franklin K. Lane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Makers of the Flag This morning, as I passed into the land office, the flag dropped me a most cordial salutation, and from its rippling folds I heard it say, Good morning, Mr. Flagmaker. I beg your pardon, old glory, I said. Aren't you mistaken? I am not the President of the United States, nor a member of Congress, nor even a general in the army. I am only a government clerk. I greet you again, Mr. Flagmaker, replied the gay voice. I know you well. You are the man who worked in the swelter of yesterday, straightening out the tangle of that farmer's homestead in Idaho. Or perhaps you found the mistake in that Indian contract in Oklahoma, or helped to clear that patent for the hopeful inventor in New York, or pushed the opening of that new ditch in Colorado, or made that mine in Illinois more safe, or brought relief to the old soldier in Wyoming. No matter whichever one of these beneficent individuals you may happen to be, I give you greeting, Mr. Flagmaker. I was about to pass on when the flag stopped me with these words. Yesterday the President spoke a word that made happier the future of ten million peons in Mexico, but that act looms no larger on the flag than the struggle which the boy in Georgia is making to win the Corn Club prize this summer. Yesterday the Congress spoke a word which will open the door of Alaska but a mother in Michigan worked from sunrise until far into the night to give her boy an education. She, too, is making the flag. Yesterday we made a new law to prevent financial panics, and yesterday, maybe, a school teacher in Ohio taught his first letters to a boy who will one day write a song that will give cheer to the millions of our race. We are all making the flag. But, I said impatiently, these people were only working. Then came a great shout from the flag. The work that we do is the making of the flag. I am not the flag, not at all. I am but its shadow. I am whatever you make me, nothing more. I am your belief in yourself, your dream of what a people may become. I live a changing life, a life of moods and passions, of heartbreaks and tired muscles. Sometimes I am strong with pride, when men do an honest work, fitting the rails together truly. Sometimes I droop, for then the purpose has gone from me, and cynically I play the coward. Sometimes I am loud, garish, and full of that ego that blasts judgment. But always I am all that you hope to be, and have courage to try for. I am song and fear, struggle and panic, and ennobling hope. I am the day's work of the weakest man, and the largest dream of the most daring. I am the Constitution and the courts, statutes and the statute makers, soldier and dreadnought, drayman and street sweep, cook, counselor and clerk. I am the battle of yesterday and the mistake of tomorrow. I am the mystery of the men who do without knowing why. I am the clutch of an idea and the reason of purpose of resolution. I am no more than what you believe me to be, and I am all that you believe I can be. I am what you make me, nothing more. I swing before your eyes as a bright gleam of color, a symbol of yourself, the pictured suggestion of that big thing which makes this nation. My stars and my stripes are your dream and your labors. They are bright with cheer, brilliant with courage, firm with faith because you have made them so out of your hearts. For you are the makers of the flag, and it is well that you glory in the making. End of the Makers of the Flag by Franklin K. Lane Read by Phil Schempf An Oration on the Life and Services of Thomas Paine by Robert G. Ingersoll This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Oration on the Life and Services of Thomas Paine by Robert G. Ingersoll, delivered by Robert G. Ingersoll at Fairbury, Illinois, on the evening of January 30th, 1871, Peoria, Illinois. To speak the praises of the brave and thoughtful dead is to me a labor of gratitude and love. Through all the centuries gone, the mind of man has been beleaguered by the mailed hosts of superstition. Slowly and painfully has advanced the army of deliverance. Hated by those they wished to rescue, despised by those they were dying to save, these grand soldiers, these immortal deliverers, have fought without thanks, labored without applause, suffered without pity, and they have died execrated and abhorred. For the good of mankind, they accepted isolation, poverty, and calumny. They gave up all, sacrificed all, lost all but truth and self-respect. One of the bravest soldiers in this army was Thomas Paine, and for one I feel indebted to him for the liberty we are enjoying this day. Born among the poor, where children are burdens, in a country where real liberty was unknown, where the privileges of class were guarded with infinite jealousy, and the rights of the individual trampled beneath the feet of priests and nobles, where to advocate justice was treason, where intellectual freedom was infidelity, it is wonderful that the idea of true liberty ever entered his brain. Poverty was his mother, necessity his master. He had more brains than books, more sense than education, more courage than politeness, more strength than polish. He had no veneration for old mistakes, no admiration for ancient lies. He loved the truth for the truth's sake and for man's sake. He saw oppression on every hand, injustice everywhere, hypocrisy at the altar, venality on the bench, tyranny on the throne, and with a splendid carriage he espoused the cause of the weak against the strong, of the enslaved many against the titled few. In England he was nothing. He belonged to the lower classes. There was no avenue open for him. The people hugged their chains, and the whole power of the government was ready to crush any man who endeavored to strike a blow for the right. At the age of 37, Thomas Paine left England for America, with the high hope of being instrumental in the establishment of a free government. In his own country, he could accomplish nothing. Those two vultures, church and state, were ready to tear in pieces and devour the heart of any one who might deny their divine right to enslave the world. Upon his arrival in this country, he found himself possessed of a letter of introduction, signed by another infidel, the illustrious Franklin. This and his native genius constituted his entire capital, and he needed no more. He found the colonies clamoring for justice, whining about their grievances, upon their knees at the foot of the throne, imploring that mixture of idiocy and insanity, George the Third, by the grace of God, for a restoration of their ancient privileges. They were not endeavoring to become free men, but were trying to soften the heart of their master. They were perfectly willing to make brick if Pharaoh would furnish the straw. The colonists wished for, hoped for, and prayed for reconciliation. They did not dream of independence. Paine gave to the world his common sense. It was the first argument for separation, the first assault upon the British form of government, the first blow for a republic, and it roused our fathers like a trumpet's blast. He was the first to perceive the destiny of the new world. No other pamphlet ever published accomplished such wonderful results. It was filled with argument, reason, persuasion, and unanswerable logic. It opened a new world. It filled the present with hope and the future with honor. Everywhere the people responded, and in a few months the Continental Congress declared the colonies free and independent states. A new nation was born. It is simple justice to say that Paine did more to cause the Declaration of Independence than any other man. Neither should it be forgotten that his attacks upon Great Britain were also attacks upon monarchy, and while he convinced the people that the colonies ought to separate from the mother country, he also proved to them that a free government is the best that can be instituted among men. In my judgment, Thomas Paine was the best political writer that ever lived. What he wrote was pure nature, and his soul and his pen ever went together. 
ceremony pageantry and all the paraphernalia of power had no effect upon him he examined into the why and wherefore of things he was perfectly radical in his mode of thought nothing short of the bedrock satisfied him his enthusiasm for what he believed to be right knew no bounds during all the dark scenes of the revolution never for one moment did he despair year after year his brave words were ringing through the land and by the bivouac fires the weary soldiers read the inspiring words of common sense filled with ideas sharper than their swords and consecrated themselves anew to the cause of freedom Payne was not content with having aroused the spirit of independence but he gave every energy of his soul to keep that spirit alive he was with the army he shared its defeats its dangers and its glory when the situation became desperate when gloom settled upon all he gave them the crisis it was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night leading the way to freedom honor and glory he shouted to them these are the times that try men's souls the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country but he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman to those who wish to put the war off to some future day with a lofty and touching spirit of self-sacrifice he said every generous parent should say if there must be war let it be in my day that my child may have peace to the cry that americans were rebels he replied he that rebels against reason is a real rebel but he that in defense of reason rebels against tyranny has a better title to defender of the faith than george the third some said it was not to the interest of the colonies to be free Paine answered this by saying to know whether it be the interest of the continent to be independent we need ask only this simple easy question is it the interest of a man to be a boy all his life he found many who would listen to nothing and to them he said that to argue with a man who has renounced his reason is like giving medicine to the dead this sentiment ought to adorn the walls of every orthodox church there is a world of political wisdom in this england lost her liberty in a long chain of right reasoning from wrong principles and there is real discrimination in saying the greeks and romans were strongly possessed of the spirit of liberty but not the principles for at the time that they were determined not to be slaves themselves they employed their power to enslave the rest of mankind in his letter to the british people in which he tried to convince them that war was not to their interest occurs the following passage brimful of common sense war can never be the interest of a trading nation any more than quarreling can be profitable to a man in business but to make war with those who trade with us is like setting a bulldog upon a customer at the shop door the writings of Paine fairly glitter with simple, compact, logical statements that carry conviction to the dullest and most prejudiced. He had the happiest possible way of putting the case, in asking questions in such a way that they answer themselves, and in stating his premises so clearly that the deduction could not be avoided. Day and night he labored for America. Month after month, year after year, he gave himself to the great cause until there was a government of the people and for the people and until the banner of the stars floated over a continent redeemed and consecrated to the happiness of mankind at the close of the revolution no one stood higher in america than thomas paine the best the wisest the most patriotic were his friends and admirers and had he been thinking only of his own good he might have rested from his toils and spent the remainder of his life in comfort and in ease he could have been what the world is pleased to call respectable he could have died surrounded by clergymen, warriors, and statesmen. At his death, there would have been an imposing funeral, miles of carriages, civic societies, salvos of artillery, a nation in mourning, and above all, a splendid monument covered with lies. He chose rather to benefit mankind. At that time, the seeds sown by the great infidels were beginning to bear fruit in France. The people were beginning to think. The 18th century was crowning its gray hairs with the wreath of progress. On every hand, science was bearing testimony against the church. Voltaire had filled Europe with light. De Holbach was giving to the elite of Paris the principles contained in his system of nature. The encyclopedists had attacked superstition with information for the masses. The foundation of things began to be examined. 
A few had the courage to keep their shoes on and let the bush burn. Miracles began to get scarce. Everywhere the people began to inquire. America had set an example to the world. The word liberty began to be in the mouths of men, and they began to wipe the dust from their knees. The dawn of a new day had appeared. Thomas Paine went to France. Into the new movement he threw all his energies. His fame had gone before him, and he was welcomed as a friend of the human race and as a champion of free government. He had never relinquished his intention of pointing out to his countrymen the defects, absurdities, and abuses of the English government. For this purpose, he composed and published his greatest political work, The Rights of Man. This work should be read by every man and woman. It is concise, accurate, natural, convincing, and unanswerable. It shows great thought, an intimate knowledge of the various forms of government, deep insight into the very springs of human action, and a courage that compels respect and admiration. The most difficult political problems are solved in a few sentences. The venerable arguments in favor of wrong are refuted with a question, answered with a word. For forcible illustration, apt comparison, accuracy and clearness of statement, and absolute thoroughness, it has never been excelled. The fears of the administration were aroused, and Paine was prosecuted for libel and found guilty. And yet, there is not a sentiment in the entire work that will not challenge the admiration of every civilized man. It is a magazine of political wisdom, an arsenal of ideas, and an honor, not only to Thomas Paine, but to human nature itself. It could have been written only by the man who had the generosity, the exalted patriotism, the goodness to say, the world is my country, and to do good my religion. There is, in all the utterances of the world, no grander, no sublimer sentiment. There is no creed that can be compared with it for a moment. It should be wrought in gold, adorned with jewels, and impressed upon every human heart. The world is my country, and to do good my religion. In 1792, Paine was elected by the Department of Calais as their representative in the National Assembly. So great was his popularity in France that he was selected about the same time by the people of no less than four departments. Upon taking his place in the assembly, he was appointed as one of a committee to draft a constitution for France. Had the French people taken the advice of Thomas Paine, there would have been no reign of terror. The streets of Paris would not have been filled with blood. The revolution would have been the grandest success of the world. The truth is that Paine was too conservative to suit the leaders of the French Revolution. They, to a great extent, were carried away by hatred and a desire to destroy. They had suffered so long, they had borne so much, that it was impossible for them to be moderate in the hour of victory. Besides all this, the French people had been so robbed by the government, so degraded by the church, that they were not fit material with which to construct a republic. Many of the leaders longed to establish a beneficent and just government, but the people asked for revenge. Paine was filled with a real love for mankind. His philanthropy was boundless. He wished to destroy monarchy, not the monarch. He voted for the destruction of tyranny and against the death of the king. He wished to establish a government on a new basis, one that would forget the past, one that would give privileges to none and protection to all. In the assembly, where nearly all were demanding the execution of the king, where to differ from the majority was to be suspected, and where to be suspected was almost certain death, Thomas Paine had the courage, the goodness, and the justice to vote against death. To vote against the execution of the king was a vote against his own life. This was the sublimity of devotion to principle. For this he was arrested, imprisoned, and doomed to death. Search the records of the world, and you will find but few sublimer acts than that of Thomas Paine voting against the king's death. He, the hater of despotism, the abhorrer of monarchy, the champion of the rights of man, the republican, accepting death to save the life of a deposed tyrant, of a throneless king. This was the last grand act of his political life, the sublime conclusion of his political career. All his life he had been the disinterested friend of man. He had labored, not for money, not for fame, but for the general good. He had aspired to no office, had asked no recognition of his services, but had ever been content to labor as a common soldier in the army of progress. 
confining his efforts to no country, looking upon the world as his field of action, filled with a genuine love for the right, he found himself imprisoned by the very people he had striven to save. Had his enemy succeeded in bringing him to the block, he would have escaped the calumnies and the hatred of the Christian world. In this country, at least, he would have ranked with the proudest names. On the anniversary of the Declaration, his name would have been upon the lips of all the orators and his memory in the hearts of all the people. Thomas Paine had not finished his career. He had spent his life thus far in destroying the power of kings, and now he turned his attention to the priests. He knew that every abuse had been embalmed in Scripture, that every outrage was in partnership with some holy text. He knew that the throne skulked behind the altar and both behind a pretended revelation from God. By this time, he had found that it was of little use to free the body and leave the mind in chains. He had explored the foundations of despotism and found them infinitely rotten. He had dug under the throne, and it occurred to him that he would take a look behind the altar. The result of his investigations was given to the world in the Age of Reason. From the moment of its publication, he became infamous. He was calumniated beyond measure. To slander him was to secure the thanks of the church. All his services were instantly forgotten, disparaged, or denied. He was shunned as though he had been a pestilence. Most of his old friends forsook him. He was regarded as a moral plague, and at the bare mention of his name, the bloody hands of the church were raised in horror. He was denounced as the most despicable of men. Not content with following him to his grave, they pursued him after death with redoubled fury and recounted with infinite gusto and satisfaction the supposed horrors of his deathbed, gloried in the fact that he was forlorn and friendless and gloated like fiends over what they supposed to be the agonizing remorse of his lonely death. It is wonderful that all his services were thus forgotten. It is amazing that one kind word did not fall from some pulpit, that some one did not accord to him at least honesty. Strange that in the general denunciation some one did not remember his labor for liberty, his devotion to principle, his zeal for the rights of his fellow men. He had, by brave and splendid effort, associated his name with the cause of progress. He had made it impossible to write the history of political freedom with his name left out. He was one of the creators of light, one of the heralds of the dawn. He hated tyranny in the name of kings and in the name of God with every drop of his noble blood. He believed in liberty and justice and in the sacred doctrine of human equality. Under these divine banners he fought the battle of his life. In both worlds he offered his blood for the good of man. In the wilderness of America, in the French Assembly, in the somber cell waiting for death, he was the same unflinching, unwavering friend of his race, the same undaunted champion of universal freedom. And for this he has been hated. For this the Church has violated even his grave. This is enough to make one believe that nothing is more natural than for men to devour their benefactors. The people in all ages have crucified and glorified. Whoever lifts his voice against abuses, whoever arraigns the past at the bar of the present, whoever asks the king to show his commission, or questions the authority of the priest, will be denounced as the enemy of man and God. In all ages, reason has been regarded as the enemy of religion. Nothing has been considered so pleasing to the deity as a total denial of the authority of your own mind. Self-reliance has been thought a deadly sin, and the idea of living and dying without the aid and consolation of superstition has always horrified the church. By some unaccountable infatuation, belief has been, and still is considered, of immense importance. All religions have been based upon the idea that God will forever reward the true believer and eternally damn the man who doubts or denies. Belief is regarded as the one essential thing. To practice justice, to love mercy, is not enough. You must believe in some incomprehensible creed. You must say, once one is three, and three times one is one. The man who practiced every virtue but failed to believe was execrated. Nothing so outrages the feelings of the church as a moral unbeliever. Nothing so horrible as a charitable atheist. When Paine was born, the world was religious. The pulpit was the real throne, 
and the churches were making every effort to crush out of the brain the idea that it had the right to think. The splendid saying of Lord Bacon that the inquiry of truth, which is the love-making or wooing of it, the knowledge of truth, which is the presence of it, and the belief of truth, which is the enjoying of it, are the sovereign good of human nature, has been and ever will be rejected by religionists. Intellectual liberty, as a matter of necessity, forever destroys the idea that belief is either praised or blameworthy, and is wholly inconsistent with every creed in Christendom. Paine recognized this truth. He also saw that as long as the Bible was considered inspired, this infamous doctrine of the virtue of belief would be believed and preached. He examined the scriptures for himself and found them filled with cruelty, absurdity, and immorality. He again made up his mind to sacrifice himself for the good of his fellow men. He commenced with the assertion that any system of religion that has anything in it that shocks the mind of a child cannot be a true system. What a beautiful, what a tender sentiment. No wonder that the church began to hate him. He believed in one God and no more. After this life, he hoped for happiness. He believed that true religion consisted in doing justice, loving mercy, in endeavoring to make our fellow creatures happy, and in offering to God the fruit of the heart. He denied the inspiration of the scriptures. This was his crime. He contended that it is a contradiction in terms to call anything a revelation that comes to us at second hand, either verbally or in writing. He asserted that revelation is necessarily limited to the first communication, and that after that it is only an account of something which another person says was a revelation to him. We have only his word for it, as it was never made to us. This argument never has been and probably never will be answered. He denied the divine origin of Christ and showed conclusively that the pretended prophecies of the Old Testament had no reference to him whatever and yet he believed that Christ was a virtuous and amiable man, that the morality he taught and practiced was of the most benevolent and elevated character, and that it had not been exceeded by any. Upon this point he entertained the same sentiments now held by Unitarians, and in fact by all the most enlightened Christians. In his time, the church believed and taught that every word in the Bible was absolutely true. Since his day, it has been proven false in its cosmogony, false in its astronomy, false in its chronology, false in its history, and so far as the Old Testament is concerned, false in almost everything. There are but few, if any, scientific men who apprehend that the Bible is literally true. Who on earth at this day would pretend to settle any scientific question by a text from the Bible? The old belief is confined to the ignorant and zealous. The church itself will before long be driven to occupy the position of Thomas Paine. The best minds of the Orthodox world today are endeavoring to prove the existence of a personal deity. All other questions occupy a minor place. You are no longer asked to swallow the Bible whole, whale, Jonah, and all. You are simply required to believe in God and pay your pew rent. There is not now an enlightened minister in the world who will seriously contend that Samson's strength was in his hair nor that the necromancers of Egypt could turn water into blood and pieces of wood into serpents. These follies have passed away, and the only reason that the religious world can now have for disliking Paine is that they have been forced to adopt so many of his opinions. Paine thought the barbarities of the Old Testament inconsistent with what he deemed was the real character of God. He believed that murder, massacre, and indiscriminate slaughter had never been commanded by the deity. He regarded much of the Bible as childish, unimportant, and foolish. The scientific world entertains the same opinion. Paine attacked the Bible precisely in the same spirit in which he had attacked the pretensions of kings. He used the same weapons. All the pomp in the world could not make him cower. His reason knew no holy of holies except the abode of truth. The sciences were then in their infancy. The attention of the really learned had not been directed to an impartial examination of our pretended revelation. It was accepted by most as a matter of course. The church was all-powerful, and no one, unless thoroughly imbued with the spirit of self-sacrifice, thought for a moment of disputing the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. The infamous doctrine that salvation depends upon belief, upon a mere intellectual conviction, was then believed and preached. 
to doubt was to secure the damnation of your soul this absurd and devilish doctrine shocked the common sense of thomas paine and he denounced it with the fervor of honest indignation this doctrine although infinitely ridiculous has been nearly universal and has been as hurtful as senseless for the overthrow of the infamous tenet paine exerted all his strength he left few arguments to be used by those who should come after him and he used none that have been refuted the combined wisdom and genius of all mankind cannot possibly conceive of an argument against liberty of thought neither can they show why any one should be punished either in this world or another for acting honestly in accordance with reason and yet a doctrine with every possible argument against it has been and still is believed and defended by the entire orthodox world can it be possible that we have been endowed with reason simply that our souls may be caught in its toils and snares that we may be led by its false and delusive glare out of the narrow path that leads to joy into the broad way of everlasting death is it possible that we have been given reason simply that we may through faith ignore its deductions and avoid its conclusions ought the sailor to throw away his compass and depend entirely upon the fog if reason is not to be depended upon in matters of religion that is to say in respect of our duties to the deity why should it be relied upon in matters respecting the rights of our fellows why should we throw away the laws given to moses by god himself and have the audacity to make some of our own how dare we drown the thunders of sinai by calling the eyes and nose in a petty legislature if reason can determine what is merciful what is just the duties of man to man what more do we want either in time or eternity down forever down with any religion that requires upon its ignorant altar the sacrifice of the goddess reason that compels her to abdicate forever the shining throne of the soul strips from her form the imperial purple snatches from her hand the sceptre of thought and makes her the bondwoman of a senseless faith if a man should tell you he had the most beautiful painting in the world and after taking you where it was should insist on having your eyes shut you would likely suspect either that he had no painting or that it was some pitiable daub should he tell you that he was a most excellent performer on the violin and yet refused to play unless your ears were stopped you would think to say the least of it that he had an odd way of convincing you of his musical ability but would his conduct be any more wonderful than that of a religionist who asks that before examining his creed you will have the kindness to throw away your reason the first gentleman says keep your eyes shut my picture will bear everything but being seen keep your ears stopped my music objects to nothing but being heard the last says away with your reason my religion dreads nothing but being understood so far as i am concerned i most cheerfully admit that most christians are honest and most ministers sincere we do not attack them we attack their creed we accord to them the same rights that we ask for ourselves we believe that their doctrines are hurtful we believe that the frightful text he that believes shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned has covered the earth with blood it has filled the heart with arrogance cruelty and murder it has caused the religious wars bound hundreds of thousands to the stake founded inquisitions filled dungeons invented instruments of torture taught the mother to hate her child imprisoned the mind filled the world with ignorance persecuted the lovers of wisdom built the monasteries and convents made happiness a crime investigation a sin and self-reliance a blasphemy it has poisoned the springs of learning misdirected the energies of the world filled all countries with want housed the people in hovels fed them with famine and but for the efforts of a few brave infidels it would have taken the world back to the midnight of barbarism and left the heavens without a star the maligners of pain say that he had no right to attack this doctrine because he was unacquainted with the dead languages and for this reason it was a piece of pure impudence in him to investigate the scriptures is it necessary to understand hebrew in order to know that cruelty is not a virtue and that murder is inconsistent with infinite goodness and that eternal punishment can be inflicted upon man only by an eternal fiend is it really essential to conjugate the greek verbs before you can make up your mind as to the probability of dead people getting out of their graves must one be versed in latin before he is entitled to express his opinion as to the genuineness of a pretended revelation from god 
Common sense belongs exclusively to no tongue. Logic is not confined to, nor has it been buried with, the dead languages. Paine attacked the Bible as it is translated. If the translation is wrong, let its defenders correct it. The Christianity of Paine's day is not the Christianity of our time. There has been a great improvement since then. One hundred and fifty years ago, the foremost preachers of our time would have perished at the stake. A universalist would have been torn in pieces in England, Scotland, and America. Unitarians would have found themselves in the stocks, pelted by the rabble with dead cats, after which their ears would have been cut off, their tongues bored, and their foreheads branded. Less than 150 years ago, the following law was in force in Maryland. Be it enacted by the right honorable, the Lord Proprietor, by and with the advice and consent of his lordship's governor and the upper and lower houses of the assembly and the authority of the same that if any person shall hereafter within this province wittingly maliciously and advisedly by writing or speaking blaspheme or curse god or deny our saviour jesus christ to be the son of god or shall deny the holy trinity the father son and holy ghost or the godhead of any of the three persons or the unity of the godhead or shall utter any profane words concerning the Holy Trinity, or any of the persons thereof, and shall thereof be convict by verdict, shall for the first offense be bored through the tongue, and find twenty pounds to be levied of his body. And for the second offense, the offender shall be stigmatized by burning in the forehead with the letter B, and find forty pounds. And that for the third offense, the offender shall suffer death without the benefit of clergy." The strange thing about this law is that it has never been repealed and is still in force in the District of Columbia. Laws like this were in force in most of the colonies and in all countries where the church had power. In the Old Testament, the death penalty was attached to hundreds of offenses. It has been the same in all Christian countries. Today, in civilized governments, the death penalty is attached only to murder and treason, and in some it has been entirely abolished. What a commentary upon the divine humbugs of the world. In the day of Thomas Paine, the church was ignorant, bloody, and relentless. In Scotland, the kirk was at the summit of its power. It was a full sister of the Spanish Inquisition. It waged war upon human nature. It was the enemy of happiness, the hater of joy, and the despiser of religious liberty. It taught parents to murder their children rather than to allow them to propagate error. If the mother held opinions of which the infamous Kirk disapproved, her children were taken from her arms, her babe from her very bosom, and she was not allowed to see them or to write them a word. It would not allow shipwrecked sailors to be rescued from drowning on Sunday. It sought to annihilate pleasure, to pollute the heart by filling it with religious cruelty and gloom, and to change mankind into a vast horde of pious, heartless fiends. One of the most famous Scotch divines said, The Kirk holds that religious toleration is not far from blasphemy. And the same Scotch Kirk denounced, beyond measure, the man who had the moral grandeur to say, The world is my country, and to do good my religion. And this same Kirk abhorred the man who said, Any system of religion that shocks the mind of a child cannot be a true system. At that time, nothing so delighted the church as the beauties of endless torment and listening to the weak wailings of damned infants struggling in the slimy coils and poison folds of the worm that never dies. About the beginning of the 19th century, a boy by the name of Thomas Aikenhead was indicted and tried at Edinburgh for having denied the inspiration of the scriptures, and for having, on several occasions when cold, wished himself in hell that he might get warm. Notwithstanding, the poor boy recanted and begged for mercy. He was found guilty and hanged. His body was thrown in a hole at the foot of the scaffold and covered with stones. Prosecutions and executions like this were common in every Christian country, and all of them were based upon the belief that an intellectual conviction is a crime. No wonder the church hated and traduced the author of the Age of Reason. England was filled with Puritan gloom and Episcopal ceremony. All religious conceptions were of the grossest nature. The ideas of crazy fanatics and extravagant poets were taken as sober facts. Milton had clothed Christianity in the soiled and faded finery of the gods, had added to the story of Christ the fables of mythology. He gave to the Protestant church the most outrageously material ideas of the deity. He turned all the angels into soldiers, made heaven a battlefield, put Christ in uniform, 
and described God as a militia general. His works were considered by the Protestants nearly as sacred as the Bible itself, and the imagination of the people was thoroughly polluted by the horrible imagery, the sublime absurdity of the blind Milton. Heaven and hell were realities. The judgment day was expected. Books of account would be opened. Every man would hear the charges against him read. God was supposed to sit on a golden throne, surrounded by the tallest angels with harps in their hands and crowns on their heads. The goats would be thrust into eternal fire on the left, while the orthodox sheep on the right were to gamble on sunny slopes forever and forever. The nation was profoundly ignorant, and consequently extremely religious, as far as belief was concerned. In Europe, liberty was lying chained in the Inquisition, her white bosom stained with blood. In the New World, the Puritans had been hanging and burning in the name of God, and selling white Quaker children into slavery in the name of Christ, who said, Suffer little children to come unto me. Under such conditions, progress was impossible. Someone had to lead the way. The church is, and always has been, incapable of a forward movement. Religion always looks back. The church has already reduced Spain to a guitar, Italy to a hand organ, and Ireland to exile. Someone not connected with the church had to attack the monster that was eating out the heart of the world. Someone had to sacrifice himself for the good of all. The people were in the most abject slavery. Their manhood had been taken from them by pomp, by pageantry, and power. Progress is born of doubt and inquiry. The church never doubts, never inquires. To doubt is heresy. To inquire is to admit that you do not know. The church does neither. More than a century ago, Catholicism, wrapped in robes red with the innocent blood of millions, holding in her frantic clutch crowns and scepters, honors and gold, the keys of heaven and hell, trampling beneath her feet the liberties of nations, in the proud moment of almost universal dominion, felt within her heartless breast the deadly dagger of Voltaire. From that blow, the church never can recover. Livid with hatred, she launched her eternal anathema at the great destroyer, and ignorant Protestants have echoed the curse of Rome. In our country, the church was all-powerful, and although divided into many sects, would instantly unite to repel a common foe. Pain struck the first grand blow. The Age of Reason did more to undermine the power of the Protestant Church than all other books then known. It furnished an immense amount of food for thought. It was written for the average mind and is a straightforward, honest investigation of the Bible and of the Christian system. Pain did not falter from the first page to the last. He gives you his candid thought, and candid thoughts are always valuable. The Age of Reason has liberalized us all. It put arguments in the mouths of the people. It put the church on the defensive. It enabled somebody in every village to corner the parson. It made the world wiser and the church better. It took power from the pulpit and divided it among the pews. Just in proportion that the human race has advanced, the church has lost power. There's no exception to this rule. No nation ever materially advanced that held strictly to the religion of its founders. No nation ever gave itself wholly to the control of the church without losing its power, its honor, and its existence. Every church pretends to have found the exact truth. This is the end of progress. Why pursue that which you have? Why investigate when you know? Every creed is a rock in running water. Humanity sweeps by it. Every creed cries to the universe, halt. A creed is the ignorant past bullying the enlightened present. The ignorant are not satisfied with what can be demonstrated. Science is too slow for them, and so they invent creeds. They demand completeness. A sublime segment, a grand fragment, are of no value to them. They demand the complete circle, the entire structure. In music, they want a melody with a recurring accent at measured periods. In religion, they insist upon immediate answers to the questions of creation and destiny. The alpha and omega of all things must be in the alphabet of their superstition. A religion that cannot answer every question and guess every conundrum, is, in their estimation, worse than worthless. They desire a kind of theological dictionary, a religious ready reckoner, together with guideboards at all crossings and turns. They mistake impudence for authority, solemnity for wisdom, and pathos for inspiration. The beginning and the end are what they demand. The grand flight of the eagle is nothing to them. They want the nest in which he was hatched, and especially the dry limb upon which he roosts. Anything that can be learned is hardly worth knowing. The present is considered of no value in itself. Happiness must not be expected this side of the clouds. 
and can only be attained by self-denial and faith, not self-denial for the good of others, but for the salvation of your own sweet self. Paine denied the authority of Bibles and creeds. This was his crime, and for this the world shut the door in his face and emptied its slops upon him from the windows. I challenge the world to show that Thomas Paine ever wrote one line, one word in favor of tyranny, in favor of immorality, one line, one word against what he believed to be for the highest and best interest of mankind, one line, one word against justice, charity, or liberty, and yet he has been pursued as though he had been a fiend from hell. His memory has been execrated as though he had murdered some Uriah for his wife, driven some Hagar into the desert to starve with his child upon her bosom, defiled his own daughters, ripped open with the sword the sweet bodies of loving and innocent women, advised one brother to assassinate another, kept a harem with seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines, or had persecuted Christians even unto strange cities. The church has pursued pain to deter others. No effort has been in any age of the world spared to crush out opposition. The church used painting, music, and architecture simply to degrade mankind. But there are men that nothing can awe. There have been at all times brave spirits that dared even the gods. Some proud head has always been above the waves. In every age, some Diogenes has sacrificed to all the gods. True genius never cowers, and there is always some Samson feeling for the pillars of authority. Cathedrals and domes, and chimes and chants, temples frescoed and groined and carved and gilded with gold, altars and tapers, and paintings of virgin and babe, censer and chalice, chasuble, paten, and alb, organs and anthems and incense rising to the winged and blessed, maniple, amice, and stull, crosses and croziers, tiaras and crowns, mitres and missiles and masses, rosaries, relics, and robes, martyrs and saints, and windows stained as with the blood of Christ, never for one moment awed the brave, proud spirit of the infidel. He knew that all the pomp and glitter had been purchased with liberty, that priceless jewel of the soul. In looking at the cathedral, he remembered the dungeon. The music of the organ was not loud enough to drown the clank of fetters. He could not forget that the taper had lighted the faggot. He knew that the cross adorned the hilt of the sword, and so where others worshipped, he wept and scorned. The doubter, the investigator, the infidel have been the saviors of liberty. This truth is beginning to be realized, and the intellectual are beginning to honor the brave thinkers of the past. But the church is as unforgiving as ever, and still wonders why any infidel should be wicked enough to endeavor to destroy her power. I will tell the church why. You have imprisoned the human mind. You have been the enemy of liberty. You have burned us at the stake, wasted us upon slow fires, torn our flesh with iron. You have covered us with chains, treated us as outcasts. You have filled the world with fear. You have taken our wives and children from our arms. You have confiscated our property. You have denied us the right to testify in courts of justice. You have branded us with infamy. You have torn out our tongues. You have refused us burial. In the name of your religion, you have robbed us of every right, and after having inflicted upon us every evil that can be inflicted in this world, you have fallen upon your knees and with clasped hands implored your God to torment us forever. Can you wonder that we hate your doctrines, that we despise your creeds, that we feel proud to know that we are beyond your power, that we are free in spite of you, that we can express our honest thought, and that the whole world is grandly rising into the blessed light? Can you wonder that we point with pride to the fact that infidelity has ever been found battling for the rights of man, for the liberty of conscience, and for the happiness of all? Can you wonder that we are proud to know that we have always been disciples of reason and soldiers of freedom, that we have denounced tyranny and superstition and have kept our hands unstained with human blood? We deny that religion is the end or object of this life. When it is so considered, it becomes destructive of happiness, the real end of life. It becomes a hydra-headed monster reaching in terrible coils from the heavens and thrusting its thousand fangs into the bleeding, quivering hearts of men. It devours their substance, builds palaces for God who dwells not in temples made with hands, and allows his children to die in huts and hovels. It fills the earth with mourning, heaven with hatred, the present with fear, and all the future with despair. Virtue is a subordination of the passions to the intellect. It is to act in accordance with your highest convictions. It does not consist in believing, but in doing. 
This is the sublime truth that the infidels in all ages have uttered. They have handed the torch from one to the other through all the years that have fled. Upon the altar of reason they have kept the sacred fire, and through the long midnight of faith they fed the divine flame. Infidelity is liberty, all religion is slavery. In every creed man is the slave of God, woman is the slave of man, and the sweet children are the slaves of all. We do not want creeds, we want knowledge, we want happiness. And yet we are told by the church that we have accomplished nothing, that we are simply destroyers, that we tear down without building again. Is it nothing to free the mind? Is it nothing to civilize mankind? Is it nothing to fill the world with light, with discovery, with science? Is it nothing to dignify man and exalt the intellect? Is it nothing to grope your way into the dreary prisons, the damp and dropping dungeons, the dark and silent cells, where the souls of men are chained to the floors of stone, to greet them like a ray of light, like the song of a bird, the murmur of a stream, to see the dull eyes open and grow slowly bright, to feel yourself grasped by the shrunken and unused hands, and hear yourself thanked by a strange and hollow voice? Is it nothing to conduct these souls gradually into the blessed light of day, to let them see again the happy fields, the sweet green earth, and hear the everlasting music of the waves? Is it nothing to make men wipe the dust from their swollen knees, the tears from their blanched and furrowed cheeks? Is it a small thing to reave the heavens of an insatiate monster, and write upon the eternal dome glittering with stars the grand word freedom? Is it a small thing to quench the flames of hell with the holy tears of pity? To unbind the martyr from the stake, break all the chains, put out the fires of civil war, stay the sword of the fanatic, and tear the bloody hands of the church from the white throat of science? Is it a small thing to make men truly free, to destroy the dogmas of ignorance, prejudice, and power, the poisoned fables of superstition, and drive from the beautiful face of the earth the fiend of fear? It does seem as though the most zealous Christian must at times entertain some doubt as to the divine origin of his religion. For 1800 years the doctrine has been preached. For more than a thousand years the church had, to a great extent, control of the civilized world. And what has been the result? Are the Christian nations patterns of charity and forbearance? On the contrary, their principal business is to destroy each other. More than five millions of Christians are trained, educated, and drilled to murder their fellow Christians. Every nation is groaning under a vast debt incurred in carrying on war against other Christians, or defending themselves from Christian assault. The world is covered with forts to protect Christians from Christians, and every sea is covered with iron monsters ready to blow Christian brains into eternal froth. Millions upon millions are annually expended in the effort to construct still more deadly and terrible engines of death. Industry is crippled, honest toil is robbed, even beggary is taxed to defray the expenses of Christian warfare. There must be some other way to reform this world. We have tried creed and dogma and fable, and they have failed, and they have failed in all the nations dead. The people perish for the lack of knowledge. Nothing but education, scientific education, can benefit mankind. We must find out the laws of nature and conform to them. We need free bodies and free minds, free labor and free thought, chainless hands and fetterless brains. Free labor will give us wealth, free thought will give us truth. We need men with moral courage to speak and write their real thoughts and to stand by their convictions even to the very death. We need have no fear of being too radical. The future will verify all grand and brave predictions. Paine was splendidly in advance of his time, but he was orthodox compared with the infidels of today. Science, the great iconoclast, has been busy since 1809, and by the highway of progress are the broken images of the past. On every hand the people advance. The vicar of God has been pushed from the throne of the Caesars, and upon the roofs of the eternal city falls once more the shadow of the eagle. All has been accomplished by the heroic few. The men of science have explored heaven and earth, and with infinite patience have furnished the facts. The brave thinkers have used them. The gloomy caverns of superstition have been transformed into temples of thought, and the demons of the past are the angels of today. Science took a handful of sand, constructed a telescope, and with it explored the starry depths of heaven. Science wrested from the gods their thunderbolts, and now the electric spark freighted with thought and love flashes under all the waves of the sea. 
science took a tear from the cheek of unpaid labor converted it into steam created a giant that turns with tireless arm the countless wheels of toil thomas paine was one of the intellectual heroes one of the men to whom we are indebted his name is associated forever with the great republic as long as free government exists he will be remembered admired and honored he lived a long laborious and useful life the world is better for his having lived for the sake of truth he accepted hatred and reproach for his portion he ate the bitter bread of sorrow his friends were untrue to him because he was true to himself and true to them he lost the respect of what is called society but he kept his own his life is what the world calls failure and what history calls success if to love your fellow men more than self is goodness thomas paine was good if to be in advance of your time to be a pioneer in the direction of right is greatness thomas paine was great if to avow your principles and discharge your duty in the presence of death is heroic thomas paine was a hero at the age of seventy-three death touched his tired heart he died in the land his genius defended under the flag he gave to the skies slander cannot touch him now hatred cannot reach him more he sleeps in the sanctuary of the tomb beneath the quiet of the stars a few more years a few more brave men a few more rays of light and mankind will venerate the memory of him who said any system of religion that shocks the mind of a child cannot be a true system the world is my country and to do good my religion end of an oration on the life and services of thomas paine by robert g ingersoll read by colleen mcmahon